be engaged teaching could be engaged teaching um service could be engaged service so we kind of broadened that out we said you need to give us quality and document evidence that this is a, a solid piece of work that was not just for the community engaged work that was for the traditional work too we want to know that this had an impact and we need you to say something more than i think it was great we need to see some evidence of that for all the things we also talked about disaggregating that service bucket which i just spoke to you about we added a new question if you were integrating across your research teaching and service and you had a hard time putting it in one spot or the other we gave an optional spot to put it there and then this is really where things came to life we broadened the list of examples that were in those forms and recording systems so if you were doing community engaged work you could see your work as an option for putting it there and so when it says talk about your community engaged research talk about your research here are examples of what people might write here we made sure there were outreach examples and engaged examples for your teaching you definitely made sure there was outreach teaching and engaged teaching. so that as you were doing your form if you were a traditional faculty you just did the thing you always did and if you were an engaged faculty member and you were struggling like where do we put my thing is it okay to say this you see these little prompts all throughout the form say it's okay tell us about your thing here it's a problem. And I know that because I read 244 promotion and tenure forms that were turned in between 2001 and 2006, the five year span after we changed this. Okay, so let me switch gears a little bit now that I've clarified some of that confusing language so you at least know what I'm talking about the rest of the time um, to say that one of the things I think has been really helpful on our campus is to think about these big definitions we have, like that institutional one I showed you two slides ago, like ones that are floating out there from the Carnegie Foundation that promotes the community engagement classification. These are good. They set the tone, they set expectations, but they're like up here. And our faculty live here and our projects are here. And it's really hard to translate this down I wake up on a Monday morning and it's sunny but cold outside. And I want to think about engagement. What do I do? Like I can't, uh, as a as a faculty person, grasp what I do with that definition. It's very hard for me to do that. Maybe I'm the only one. So instead, at Michigan State University, we have our institutional definition, and then at more of the individual level, the faculty, the academic staff, the graduate student level, we have this pretty purple diagram. And I picked purple because I like purple. Michigan State's green and white. It probably should have been green. It's not. It's purple. So for me, from my perspective, at like a unit level or an individual level, this to me is what it is really helpful is thinking about. Is my project community engaged? How would I make a community engaged? How would I show evidence that it's community engaged? And it really has three parts. Part one is over here. Um, you have foundational scholarship that's informing and guiding what you're doing. And that should come from your home department or your discipline or your field. You have partners, and those partners are contributing the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding they have and having that flow into your work. If it's an outreach type of thing, it's a little bit. If it's an engagement thing, it's probably a lot more. And then together, your collaboration is generating two main types of things. Scholarly products that are for academic audiences and scholarly products that are for public or practitioner audiences. I'm going to unpack that a little bit more um, to help us think through this community engagement stuff. What should seem a little familiar to you if you are not a community engaged person is that traditional scholarship says you need to be basing things on theories, conceptual frameworks, and practices, and you need to be generating academic pieces. So this should not be entirely unfamiliar. Everyone's doing at least half of that diagram. Okay. Right. So the other thing you saw in the 
MSU's definition is that outreach and engagement is a scholarly endeavor. All the time, I say that all the time. That means we adhere to principles and standards of what it means to do a scholarly job well. These are the same things you do in a traditional faculty appointment. And you see them. You need to have expertise. You need to have clear goals and pick appropriate methods. You need to disseminate your work. It needs to be peer reviewed. Um, it should have significance. You can pick a fight with me on number four if you're a qualitative researcher and I will be okay with that. Um, the peer review is five. And then for community engagement, we want you to have reflection as part of what you're doing with that. Number seven, I think is really awkward. What that means is as you're collaborating with your partner, you claim your part and you do not claim the part they did. You're clear about what role you had in your personal contribution. And then number eight, ethics shows up. Always a little disturbed, that's number eight, but at least it's on the list. So when we talk about community engagement as a scholarly endeavor, we are saying the same thing about rigor, about quality, about taking a scholarly approach to the work as we would to a traditional researcher. Except that it's a little harder because traditional research has these <coughs> items here. And if you're a community engaged researcher, you're doing both of these things. You're making sure that you have clear goals that work for, let's say research, and those clear goals also work for your community partner from their perspective. You're making sure that the methods you pick are appropriate to that research problem, but you're also making sure that they're okay and appropriate from your partner's perspective. And so you're doing the same things a traditional scholar would do in terms of rigor and quality, but then it's constantly being looped back and vetted through the community partner lens, and you're finding that point where both of you are satisfied with those choices. You are not setting aside standards of rigor to do academic work well. You are holding those up. Okay, that makes sense. I see some heads nodding. Okay, I like heads nodding. So when I say foundational scholarship, I mean those theories, conceptual frameworks, and best practices. If you are talking to a faculty member in your department who is doing community-engaged scholarship, it is a fair game question to say, tell me about the theory that's guiding your work. What are the intellectual foundations of that project? They should be able to say that to you. And if they're fumbling, ask them some more questions and help them articulate that uh, because that's a key thing. When I say foundational scholarship, I think that those like, theories and conceptual frameworks can come from anything on this list. So from their field, about the community, about the population. Um, there is scholarship around methods, of course. There's scholarship about engagement techniques. There's scholarship around evaluating engagement techniques. This is a brainstorming list. This is not a checklist. No one's community engagement project has all eight of those things. But it's a way to kind of spark that conversation. Okay, the bottom part, community partners. This is one of the defining things that makes traditional research different than community engaged research, right? Traditional scholarship and community engaged scholarship. So communities can be defined in any number of ways. They're a shared group of people that have something in common. And it's really easy, I think, in some fields to think geographically. We have community partners in the greater Lubbock area, or we have community partners overseas, but community partners get defined lots and lots of ways. And it's important in conversation with your faculty to ask them how they're thinking about that and who the natural partners are for that might not be a nonprofit organization, it might be a healthcare system. It might be an artist collaborative. It might be somebody in that new section of town that has all those new artist studios popping up that we drove through yesterday, right? There's also this intersectionality, let me go back to that, where you might be working with African-American breast cancer survivors in urban park, urban cities in Texas. And you've got an identity, a circumstance, and a geography. Many community-engaged scholars work at those intersections of multiple types of community. It's important to just think that through. It's not just a community partner, but there's specifics about those partners in particular 
which leads you into deeper into the literature. Okay, and then this part. This is where things come out of your collaboration. So, um, Ellison and Eaton work for, at the time, did a giant promotion and tenure study uh, nationally in the arts, creative activities, and design fields. And while this is from a long time ago, 2008, uh, their report is really, really pretty good right now. And they talk about this loop between your academic products and your public products. As you're collaborating with your partners, clearly you're a faculty member and you need to have some academic pieces to show for this work, but you need pieces that are helpful to your partners too. And so it's important to think about those things together. Um, scholarly types of things that we have, we're all familiar with those. I'm sure every one of us has made multiple things on the list on the left. The things that you might make for public audiences, again, like that list of vocabulary words for outreach and engagement, I can't make that list. That list would just fill the room. You know, podcasts, decision trees, revised intake sheets for clinics. I have someone that a piece of land that was cultivated with pollinator plants was the outcome of their public part of their thing. Surely that doesn't fit everybody, but if you're an entomologist, that fits great, right? So like there's a lot of a lot of options here. Okay. So major takeaway from the purple diagram. If you do not have foundational scholarship, you are flying by the seat of your pants, you are making things up, you might be volunteering someplace. These volunteering is fine, but if you are missing that first part, it is not community engaged scholarship. You don't have the bottom of arrow. You don't have community partners. Whatever you're doing is not community engaged. It's traditional teaching, traditional research, traditional service. This is the key thing for reappointment, promotion, and tenure. If you don't have pieces coming out the other end, you have a lot of activity. You don't have a lot of accomplishments to talk about. And in the reappointment, promotion, and tenure process, we're focusing on accomplishments, right? We're focusing on what is this person accomplished as a scholar that is building their field, that is making an impact. So it's really important as you talk with your community engaged faculty that you help them think about what those impacts might be, what those products might be, and help them kind of make sure they're not forgetting that part. Yes. Okay, I have a question. Says, this is not likely community engagement in spirit or purely altruistic. However, is there any guidance to two-way research-based startup or spin-off formation towards tenure and promotion? Yeah, okay. So um, from where I sit, startups, entrepreneurship, commercialized activities, things like that are not necessarily automatically off the table. I go back to this. Is there a foundational scholarship guiding what's happening? Are there partners beyond the border of our campus? And through that collaboration of your knowledge and their knowledge, is something new coming out of that? If something new is coming out of that and it's a brand new business, maybe that's the something new that came out of that. So I think it's a matter of what the collaboration looks like. It's a matter of the person's field and how they can talk about the linkages between their disciplinary background and what that looks like. So I can't say that's an automatic no. I would say like, I need more detail on the how um, and how that makes sense given the rest of that researcher's body of work, which is really cool because I'm gonna talk about that in like two minutes. So it's fall, uh, it's fall in Michigan at least, the leaves are pretty and they're falling down. Um, and I wanted to just remind everybody that like, when we think about oak trees, there's not one oak tree. There's lots of oak trees. The leaves look different, the acorns look different. And I am pretty sure I walked by an oak tree on my way to this library. I think I saw an acorn bigger than any acorn I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. And it's everything I could do not to like, reach down and pick it up and put it in my bag. Um, Cause what am I gonna do with an acorn from here? USDA will probably nab me at the airport. We're taking agricultural products around. My point here is that 
Outreach and engagement, community engaged scholarship should not look like one thing. We don't have one oak tree. It should look similar. We have leaves, we have a tree, we have acorns, but they should all look kind of like different variations. And it's perfectly okay that your department and your department and your department, it doesn't look the same, but even within your department, your faculty members are working with community partners and it looks slightly different from one another. That's really okay. It means you're listening to your partners. Does your biology look like for you to know that those are fir oaks? That I walk by? Thank you, Chair of Biology. I really appreciate that and I did not know that. So, see, what a gift. This is so good. So there are different types of work that fall under that community engagement umbrella. So if it has foundational scholarship and community partners, and you're collaborating to generate something together, you might be doing research. You might be doing art. <coughs> you might be doing lots of kinds of teaching and learning. Some in the classroom, some community workshops. You might actually even be co-creating things that stand alone, like one of our cancer researchers on campus that worked with a caregiver group. So when you wake up at three in the morning and you are really worried about your loved one, what do you need to know? Why don't we put together a website when you're up at three in the morning, the things you need to know are right there at your fingertips. That's a type of teaching and learning. She pulled together educational materials to be available asynchronously when people needed them. And it was done in collaboration with a partner. There is service and practice. Uh, this, this means consulting, policy work, legal advice. Uh, it's what our healthcare professions people do. And then wait for it, there's commercialized activities. So if you've got foundational scholarship, a partner beyond your campus, things coming out of that collaboration, some of our fields in some of our departments, the way their work and their knowledge makes a difference in the world is through something that looks like economic development, looks like a patent. It looks like one of our chemists on campus who worked with one of our companies that ships a lot of stuff who said, I hate these styrofoam peanuts we can't recycle in Michigan anywhere. Hey, Mr. Chemist, I have this problem. Can you make me a different packing peanut? And the chemist said, okay. And so over a number of years of working and going back and forth, the chemist helped solve the problem for the guy shipping everything and figured out how to make packing peanuts out of cornstarch. That when you put them in the sink and run the tap, they melt and go away. And they have the structural integrity that's needed to pack the things without smashing them up. Fortunately, the right kind of corn lives in Indiana and not Michigan, but it's still a neighboring state. My point is that chemist outreach is in community engaged scholarship took the form of a patent for cornstarch based peanuts. That's a commercialized activity kind of falls in that category. So those things are not off the table, but also just not talked about very much. Which leaves some of our faculty out in the cold, not seeing how they can do outreach and engagement if they want to. Okay, I'm gonna keep jumping along here. Also, super important to know that your faculty come to this work, you may come to this work for totally different reasons. Not everyone's motivation for community engagement is the same. So they might frame their work differently, they might come to it from different types of points of passion, and they might argue with each other a whole lot. If one of their motivations is really different than somebody else's, here's why we do this work. That's not why I do this work. Be prepared for those conversations that might be kind of passionate. Um, some of our researchers do it because it helps with their rigor, the relevance, and the reach of their work. They also sometimes do outreach and engagement because it's now part of funding requirements for NSF. Um, our teachers often do this work because they can teach better in collaboration with community engagement people. I uh, used to teach undergraduates about community economic development. I could teach you that with book learning. We can go in the community and have community partners that do this work, talk about this work. It is a completely different kind of teaching. I would feel awkward and strange if I was told I may only teach from book learning. I don't feel like I can teach my subject that way. Not everyone feels that way. And that's commitment to people and places. This is a really important thing to think about. Um, 
in particular, as you're starting to think about younger faculty coming into your department, retaining them and helping them through the promotion and tenure process. This book that came out just a couple of years ago uh, was looking at the next generation of publicly engaged scholars and the fact that for a number of them, doing outreach and engagement doesn't feel optional to them. It's not a thing that they're going to pick and choose. They want to do it. They want to do it. And if they come work at tech and it turns out it's too hard to make it through promotion tenure or there's so many barriers or everyone tells them you're dumb if you're doing this, that's just a bad idea. They're just going to leave. That's what this book is talking about. They're going to go find work at an, a startup for entrepreneurship. They're going to go work in a nonprofit. They're going to go work someplace else. They aren't going to stay here. Which gives me a little bit of a pause when I think about what happens to the academy as a whole if the next generation of incoming brightest and best and most interesting people decide they no longer want to be part of the academy. That's a little sobering when I think about that. So this is another thing as, as an institutional leader, as a department chair, to kind of think a little bit about who have you recruited? How important is engagement to them? Do you need to kind of talk with them more and see how they're doing? Do you need to help think through how to make them successful here at this campus so they can stay? Because you don't want them to say, I can't give up my engagement and I can't work here. I can't make it work. I'm going to go. That's a hard thing. Okay, we actually made it through the first six items, but I snuck them in. I didn't know that. So here are some other things that I think um, institutional leaders like yourselves can do to help support the outreach and engagement efforts on campus. Um, set clear expectations. Help people understand what is expected. Um, make it clear this, it, that not all faculty have to do this. Boy, I would get right out in front of that message. We're going to talk about outreach engagement in the department. I just want to make it clear, not everyone has to do that. But for the people for whom that is a pathway and an interest, Let's have a conversation about what that looks like in our department. That will, that will prevent some problems if people actually listen to you. Because um, you want to help them find a way that their work is regarded as scholarly and that they're doing it in a scholarly way. Um, let me go back to that. Several years ago, I was invited to another campus in Texas to talk about reappointment, promotion, and tenure. And it is in a room like this. And there were department chairs and deans, and then there were tenure track faculty members. You will not be shocked. They kind of split themselves at the tables they sat at and did not mix themselves up. We did not do this on purpose. But I had these cards that had issues related to promotion and tenure. Where are the sticking points? And I gave them to the administrators and I gave them to the faculty. I said, do a card sort, prioritize. What do you see are the major sticking points? Is it language? Is it measurement? Is it like what counts? You know, what are the major sticking points? Total divide down the middle. The administrator said the major sticking point is faculty motivation. We can't motivate them. Over on this side, the faculty said motivation was like towards the bottom. Expectations, clear expectations are the problem we're having. So part of why I have this number seven here is based on that. We're not quite realizing how each of us see the problem, but it's worth a conversation within your own group. Like, where are those sticking points? What can we do to unstick some of them? And making those expectations clear in your policy and your practice is trickier than you think. So I did a study a few years back on the Big Ten universities and their promotion and tenure policies. This is relevant, I promise. Uh, you know the Big Ten's not 10, right? There's a accounting error there. Um, and so I was really curious to know about how outreach engagement fit into faculty responsibilities. Uh, what words did they use? Was there a way where they were encouraged to integrate things or not? You know, we're doing that, but is anyone else doing that? And I was not expecting to find what I find, found, which is this table, which is hard to read, but I will tell you about it. There were four main ways outreach and engagement showed up in the policies. One way was um, it didn't show up at all. Zero, goose egg. And that would have been at the two private institutions that are part of the Big Ten. 
just didn't come up. So I was a little surprised by that. Um, you also see that there's an option to have it as the main focus of your community engaged work. So if you look at Illinois Urbana Champaign and Indiana and Wisconsin Madison, you can say front and center, lead from the front. I'm a community engaged faculty member. Let me tell you about my engagement. I'm going to tell you about it, my research or my teaching, but I'm going to start with that. There are some that say, you can have it in there. Take a look at Iowa, I believe, but it cannot be your lead foot. Do not do that. We're explicitly telling you research is your main thing or teaching is your main thing. And you can have engagement in there, but don't leave with that. And then you see a bunch in here that like, it's just part of the reporting process. It's blended in. You can talk about it wherever you want to, wherever you don't want to. So if you tell faculty, yeah, it's okay to, to put it in your materials, you're gonna wanna need to know, is it the lead thing? Is it in there as like a secondary thing? Like, what do you mean it can be in my materials? Tell me more explicitly what that looks like. Because across the big 10, it's kind of all over the place. It's not real clear. Um, gaps, we have gaps at Michigan State. I suspect you have gaps here. I think everyone has gaps. We have an institutional policy up here. Then we have implementation here. It's not quite as clear from up here to what here is happening. There are gaps. There are gaps between what a department chair wants and sees as its vision and what the reappointment promotion tenure committee does. There are gaps. And so one of the things to do is to think about, are there ways we can make those gaps smaller? Can we help our reappointment promotion tenure committee people actually see where funding comes from for community engagement as legitimate? Can we help them see what journals, in addition to disciplinary journals, take these and why these are solid good ones? Can we ask the journal, if it's an unfamiliar one, to write a letter to the PNT packet that says, this is our rejection rate, and this is you know, how we operate as a journal. We talked a little bit today with the Faculty Success Committee about messages. The messages faculty receive about whether outreach and engagement is okay to do, discouraged to do, wait to your full faculty to do, you can do it, but don't talk about it. What are the messages that come from your formal mentors? And when we were in the hallway, what's the hallway chatter about that? This matters a lot. It may be that you're in a review conversation with your faculty, you're getting that one message, and then everything else they hear is something else. Ask them what they're hearing. Ask them if they're concerned. Ask them about the informal messages. Sometimes when you're getting those informal messages, you don't even know you're getting them until someone asks you about that. Oh yeah, actually, three people told me this is a great idea. Three people told me it's a terrible idea and I really shouldn't do it. What do you think? Make it part of the conversation. I'm almost not, I promise. Um, so in this study at North Carolina State University, um, the state legislature in North Carolina said all state schools have to have outreach engagement happening. And therefore, most of the state schools revise their reappointment promotion tenure things to follow suit. It's kind of interesting when your state legislator says, do this. Um, I don't see that happening in my state pretty much ever. So they studied what the perceptions were of department chairs about that mandate for changing the faculty expectations and how the department chairs understood it, reappointment promotion tenure people understood it, and how the faculty themselves seemed to understand it. Like, what did they like not do or do? So a couple of things really stood out. Um, it's a really easy paper to read if you'd like to. Um, Community-based participatory research journals were regarded lower than research journals and the scholarship of teaching and learning journals. Not surprising. Here's data show that. Um, in the journals themselves, they had questions about where people put value. And I guess this one is like the type of research, this is the type of journals. And then when they were thinking about like, well, what's most important? They called that, they call that the work value. Um, research and teaching were really high and service, generally speaking, and 
community engagement it was much lower and they were tied but they were like tied kind of towards the bottom so even though the state legislature mandated it and even though the institutional policy changed at the top and even though faculty had like this really complicated way of renegotiating what their expectations were every year based on this new set of standards when it came to life at the chair level and in the department level not a lot actually shifted very much so i point that out to you as the conversation here at texas tech continues to change and evolve you guys play a key role in like seeing if things happen or seeing if things don't happen um making sure it makes sense for your people and interpreting it in your disciplinary campaigns. Do some things count more than others? That's kind of a follow on to that slide. Are certain journals better? Clarify those expectations. Are there other journals that count also? Help be, have that be part of the conversation. Do certain grants count more? Um, do, do certain types of publishing count more? I don't have this on here. Uh, publishing books doesn't count at MSU. Pretty much. I think if you're in arts and humanities, it might count like you. But like if you're in political science and you publish a book, you might as well not have done anything. We just don't count them. Which is shocking if you don't know that and you write a book with a university press. It's very hard to write a book. You would like to know if that counts. So these things are not small about like figuring out what counts and making sure your people know exactly these are the things that are important. And let me clarify, these things are for later or when you have extra time or you know we're just not going to think of them in the same way okay external reviewer letters right so we've got this nice dossier we have to send it out to people who do you send it out to we don't know this is a spot where offices of outreach and engagement people who are broadly networked nationally into the community engagement place can say well, you know, I know this community engaged biologist over at Wisconsin Madison, and I bet they'd be a really good fit for your community engaged biologist here. And to help them figure out places they can send things. University of Minnesota has done one, one step beyond that. Um, they've actually internally created a community engaged scholarship reappointment promotion and tenure review committee. Lots of letters there. Um, so if you're an engaged scholar, you can send your PNT dossier to them. They are very, very highly regarded scholars on campus. They will review the community engagement parts and say, this is legitimate, this is kind of okay, and then send that review and assessment on to the reappointment promotion tenure committee in case your internal committee is not familiar with community engaged scholarship. Uh, we certainly don't have that at Michigan State, but there are other ways to help in this review process if you'd like. Okay, help people figure out how to write up their work in ways that work. So I've been talking a little bit about like what the institution can do, what department chairs can do, but faculty can also do a slightly better job at what they're doing. They can articulate the scholarly foundations. They can talk about the ties between their work and major issues in the discipline, which I'll tell you a story about in a minute they can link their work to what's happening in the institution they can also provide evidence of impact these things help community engaged faculty make their case so several years ago i met someone at a community engagement conference i was looking at her poster and it was really interesting and we exchanged cards and then like three years later she emailed me and said hey i'm getting ready to put my dossier together can i have a phone call with you and i'm like sure I'm happy to talk with you so I thought it'd be like a half hour conversation. It was like an hour and a half. And I got off the phone with her and I was kind of terrified on her behalf. So she was pulling together her work. She had done some community engagement projects. They were not really related to her major area of scholarly expertise. They did not answer fundamental questions in her discipline. She published some about them, but not in disciplinary journals. She picked all interdisciplinary community engagement journals, which is okay, but you should probably do a combination. She had gotten a small grant to do some community engaged teaching and learning. Nothing hung together. Nothing hung together at all. It didn't hang together like project to project to project. It didn't hang together her and her department. 
And I was like, how are you this far along? And no one has asked you any of these questions about you're doing your engaged work and we're okay with that, but it needs to make sense in the context in which you're working. So these are not small things to ask as questions, but they're also opportunities to have workshops and trainings and like sessions. Uh, Mary Price from IUPUI has a really great workshop she does to help faculty sit down and like literally map out the connections they see between their home department and their work and how it fits together to help start articulating that narrative in their promotion tenure documents. It's hard when you're doing it by yourself and you don't have other people to look at in your home department to figure that out, but there are ways to help faculty do that piece of writing better. I like to think about it this way. I write for academic audiences when I do peer reviewed work. I write for community partner audiences when I'm making pieces for them. And I write for my institutional audience when I'm putting together my RPT materials. That is a third distinct audience. They have specific things they're looking for. They like to hear things couched in particular ways and phrasing, just like the journal would, just like my partners would. Third audience, learn the audience, coach on that audience. It's not. Okay, we're almost done. So this is the importance of documentation. Write this stuff down. Here's the importance of narrative. You can't just say I did some stuff. You actually have to say why the stuff matters and how it fits together. It's helpful, you know, as you proceed through the steps that there's a trajectory of your work as you craft your narrative. I did this, here's what I've worked on. Here's where I am in the present. Here's where I'm going in the future. Here's why this investment of your institution in me is worthwhile to you institution. So in those 244 promotion and tenure documents, there seemed to be two main strategies faculty used. Strategy one was saying, up front, I'm a community engaged scholar. Community engagement is everything I do. This is a snippet used from permission in the IRB reviewed study that shows what that looks like. So I'm just gonna leave this here for a second. This faculty member is going from associate to full. She's in the College of Education. You can see that trajectory in her writing. There's some more of it. This was the very first page of her narrative. And you can see what she's done and where she's going. And how embedded and intertwined community engagement is in how she's talking about all of her work from top to bottom. We can also make these slides available to your group. Um, this was not how most of the people put outreach and engagement in their promotion and tenure materials. Most people picked one spot and highlighted that one spot. So maybe it fit in their research, maybe it fit in their teaching. Remember a community, com computer science engineering faculty member who talked about revamping the capstone course to be in collaboration with industry partners and talked a lot about the teaching and learning with industry partners in her teaching section. She never used the word service learning because that's not how she thought about it. But this again is a coaching moment. What's acceptable in your department? What would you like that to look like? Okay. People actually write journal articles about how you put community engagement in your dossier. This is from a colleague of mine, Nancy France, now retired. Um, she went up from promotion the first time and did not make it. They allowed her to then resubmit a couple years later. And so in this article, she talks about what she changed between review one and review two, the strategy she used to strengthen her dossier. And so there are pieces out there. If you wanted to have a conversation in your department, you wouldn't have to make up the material. You could talk about material that exists. Okay. So closing thoughts. Um, Community and having an option for community engaged scholars and a pathway for them strengthens research and teaching theirs, but your departments as well, because they're, they're using that to inform and improve practice and understanding. It adds to your student experience. Um, so if they're using students and incorporating them in part of the partnership, that's helpful to the students. 
It's supposed to generate multiple scholarly products, right? It's not just activity, it's accomplishment. This is the thing that's important. We count things as academics. We put them in digital measures and other pieces. It helps improve our partners' lives. Big ways, small ways, whether it's packing peanuts or a startup or something else, a new curriculum. And it starts to mend the issue that we have sometimes with the public and not trusting of the institutions we have. And so I think it's a really good thing to find ways for some of your faculty who want to do this, not all of your faculty want to do this, but to find pathways for them to help them be successful in doing this kind of work. And I personally think department chairs are key people in this process. Um, it's important to have the tone set at the top, but like where the rubber meets the road, this is, this is faculty life at the department level in their field, in their discipline. This is where figuring out how to make that work is super important. And I believe I just shared all of that stuff. And we still have time for questions and answers. Makes me really happy. Yes. That was terrific, incidentally. Okay. And, um, so I'm connected to the arts. Yes, I, okay. Yeah, and so we tried to put it separately and then we realized for us, um, it gets woven in. So some of the creative work that's done this community base, it is under research, yes. even if it's with us, not a scholarly article, right? If it's a production in collaboration with yes. or something. Um, and then some of it um, seems to fit under services, some of it's under teaching. So we have a, a course called uh, Theater and Dance in the Community. So every one of our students, uh, BA, BFA, MA, MFA, PhD, has to spend a semester, a semester in a community organization. The graduate students have a class simultaneous with the undergraduates. And then after about four weeks of intense preparation, they go with faculty mentors into various organizations. And sometimes that leads to things that are <coughs> scholarly or continuous. And sometimes it's related to service. Sure. Um, we really sort of wanted to have an entire section, you know, where you have community engagement, but we felt like that wouldn't necessarily be recognized as it went up as, as something that's teaching. So we have to embed it. But yeah. that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of embedding, actually. Right. It, it helps dispel that idea that community engagement is that separate extra thing you do when you have time. And it's actually part and parcel of your work. Um, I also, from my perspective, community engaged research <coughs> and community engaged creative activities, when they're in collaboration with partners, both are about the co-generation and co-discovery of something brand new that did not exist before. That's right. It is not very hard for me to see that a community engaged research discovery and a brand new piece of performance or art that has collaboratively been generated with the public are brand new things we did not have before this collaboration started. And so I see them kind of in the same spot. I don't know that most people see them that way, but like it's, it's an endeavor where you come together and something brand new comes out of that collaboration, which is different than a teaching and learning thing where you kind of know something and the collaborations are around the teaching and learning, right? And so with us, my faculty will come to me and we'll decide where the best place. Yes, okay, so you have that ongoing conversation. Yeah. That's great. It's working out, it's working out pretty well. I think uh, in the arts, I think if they're not connected to how it serves every particular community, aren't gonna survive. Yeah. So a long time ago, we sort of looked at where where we put our productions on, if we place it within. Yeah. But, you know, we 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 take the Spanish place to that community, right? Not have them come to us. Yeah. So we do a lot of site specific bound work, but then that itself is creative activity. So we have to wrap it in. Yeah. So it's, it's, for know, sure. It's a partnership building. It's yeah. the place making that goes into it. It's worked well though, and it's exciting. Good. If you are not familiar with the organization Imagining America, they are the Community Engagement Association for People in the Arts, Humanities, and Design Fields. One of the very best co conferences I've gone to in community engagement was theirs. I was allowed to go one time from my office, and it just blew my mind. So, I mean, there were panels and talks and papers, and then there were performances and community partners, and part of it was in a convention center, and part of it was out in place-based areas. And it was not any type of um, 
the creative activities were alive and well. Let me just put it that way. It was really energizing and not like anything else I've ever experienced. Do we have questions from the chat? Not quite yet. Well, I would invite questions from the chat. Um, comments, questions, things I said that were confusing or you really didn't like. I think it's clear. I think it's exciting the way that you've organized that the material. Can we share your? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah, like... we'll make sure you have it. And then you can share that for as much as you'd like. That'd be great. Um, I did not put the bibliography at the end, but if there's any citation you need, please just let me know. I'll just get it to you. I think it's just, it's really instructive about how to get people to represent what they're doing. A lot of our folks were really interested in doing it. Representation is hard. So oh, I think God. I've had an article that'd be helpful too. Although I think, I think individually our faculty member have looked collectively we probably could do a better job. Yeah. It's hard to tell your story in a way that transcends your story and speaks to the things the institution's looking for a bit, right? Yeah. And it's hard to pull in entrepreneurship. It's hard to pull in creative activities. It's hard to pull in outreach to engagement. It might be hard to pull in your international work. Like, like where do you put those things? What's the right spot for them to live in? We know they go there. And so it's a, it's a bunch of strategizing. Other thoughts or, yeah, okay, here and then here. I so like this table. I'm, a, I'm an inexperienced department chair and I would like to ask a question from that perspective. Okay. I, I, I do appreciate the presentation and I love the model and the taxonomy to think about community engaged scholarship. How do I communicate with faculty members? And, and this may be the part where I've lost a little bit of clarity in the, expl exp uh, the explanation. Community engaged scholarship can and should be recognized as an element of scholarship. Or let me rephrase this. Like Community that. engaged research can and should be recognized as an element of their research. But how do we avoid the misperception that other areas of community engaged scholarship, maybe in teaching or creative output, are also acceptable for the expectation that a faculty member has in research? Did I ask it clear enough? I got lost right at the end. Let me ask you a little. <laughs> let me let me ask you a little more point blank way. Yeah. What do I say to a faculty member who's underperforming in research, and they say, "But look at all of my community engagement." And oh, might, and well. It, and it might be very well community engaged scholarship, but not community engaged scholarship in the forms of those publications or kinds of things. It, it's community engagement that fits in those other areas. Yeah. Right. So. I think it's really good you're thinking about that because that's an important conversation to have with your faculty member so that person is on a successful pathway right so if their if their appointment is expecting research then you need to be able to say that's great i'm glad you're doing community engaged research we still need to see some of these things and i would i mean i, I make a joke but i'm not really joking a lot of activity does not actually equate to a lot of accomplishments and it takes a lot of time and effort to get a community partnership up and going, particularly if you're a new faculty and you've just moved here and you don't have connections and it takes a while. So I, I please don't think I'm underestimating how hard that is. That's really hard. But at the same time, um, you can write an article about partnership building. You can publish an article about the literature review on community engaged research that has to do with your research process. There are pieces you can pull off that community engagement process and make those products that help support your research that you need to do along the way before you have the actual findings found if you're under that kind of pressure. So I, I, you know, that's a tough thing. And I think that's why these conversations are really important. We have these expectations. We know you're doing community engaged work. We know it's taking longer. Here's some things you can do along the way. But when you, when you hit these moments, we need to see some things. And, it's, and I had a conversation with someone the past couple of days about their NSF funded projects, I think it was NSF funded, that had broader impacts work. They've been doing the grant writing fine, they've been doing the projects fine, but they haven't been publishing about the projects. So when they go up for the next round of funding, the reviewers are like, where are the publications from the projects? Well, they haven't been doing that because they've been sleep rolled up doing the projects. And they're a little not sure about how to write community engagement up, which who would be unless that's your thing. 
Um, and so, so like the issue is your, your funders asking for this, your architect community, you know, is going to ask for this. Broaden your team, find somebody who loves to write about community engagement and help get that journal article kind of formalized and out there. Well, I, I appreciated your model and I hope I haven't overinterpreted it. No. But, but the idea that it leads to some kind of outcome is what, what makes it scholarship, but the kind of outcome is what determines whether or not it's community engaged research or community engaged teaching or community engaged service. It's also the foundational scholarship. Well, but isn't that yeah. essential in all of those? Right, or but like you could be community engaged. Right, so your foundational scholarship that influences if it's a research project, it's different foundational scholarship and different outputs. Yeah. If it's a teaching and learning, it's different foundational scholarship and different outputs. Yeah, yeah. and the reason why it's important to clarify that foundational scholarship is that's being published in journals that you're going to need to publish in later. And if you skip foundational scholarship, you don't know the literature, which means you can't publish the article. Like you've, you've, that's that you mess up at the end and then you can't go back and retrofit very easily. These are good questions. You have a question too. Well, sort of. Um, the strategic plan at Texas Tech, and I haven't been on this committee when John was, list outreach as one of its three main priorities. Strategic outreach, I believe. Yes. And you mentioned in one of your comments that whereas it probably should be up here, the rubber hits the road down here at the department level. Well, John's at a much higher level than I am. It's up there, but there's not nearly as much being done. And maybe that's why you're on campus, I don't know. <laughs> but if it's supposed to be mostly done at the department level, I mean, I'm, I'll pick on, we're in the College of Arts and Sciences. Okay. And we got Zippo guidance from our college and we're doing a lousy job in our department. I'm the department chair, so I can say that we're doing a lousy job. So we obviously missed it somehow or the other. And- Or maybe it just didn't show up yet. The guidance very, isn't there yet. You're very positive. <laughs> I am most of the time, actually. <laughs> but true I, I, don't, I don't know how you, how you I mean, I have the utmost respect, respect for John and what he's doing. Yeah, of but course. We, haven't, we tried the presentations that fizzled and we haven't gotten the, this, we haven't used your model at all. Use it. I love my model, by the way. It's not it's purple. But I, I, I don't so, know. I don't so, know what here's where, do. so here's where I would start the conversation. And I, I like this as a way of starting lots of things. I would talk to your faculty about what they're doing. Like, what are you doing now? I would suspect that your faculty in some way, shape or form are doing something without people beyond the university campus. Maybe? Maybe. Maybe? Something? One or two things? And just say, who? what are you doing? Who's doing things? Not what are you doing? That came out really wrong, like it's chiding somebody. But like, what are the things we already have going on? How did those start? How are those going? Are there places we can like build that out more? Does anyone want to do that? I mean, this is the other tricky part about an institutional mandate and a department chair faculty life is what if nobody wants to do outreach and engagement in your department? What if no one's suited to that or interested even a teeny weeny bit? Well, then that's, that's another conversation that you would need to have, right? And we all know, you're laughing, but we all know we have faculty who would not be good at community engagement or outreach. They're really excellent at what they do but you would not want them talking to community partners. It would be messy and terrible. And so like, I really think that there needs to be some faculty choice in there, right? Does this make sense? Not everyone in your department might do it. Maybe a few people do that. See what they're already doing, build from there. Well, I know what people are doing, but it's not much. <laughs> we'll have a conversation with people like, what are you doing? What's it look like? Are there ways to build that out a little more? Would you like to do that? What do you need to do that? I don't know. See where they are. See where that leads you. That's a really different starting point than saying it's in the strategic plan and we have to make this work. It's really different. I to tried that approach. Didn't no, 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 no. <laughs> so it's a really, really different starting point to say, I'd like to hear what it is that's already happening. And then I'd like to hear how you think that's going. Can we build on that, expand it, strengthen it, or maybe not? but I'd like to start by listening to you first and then building from that point upward. You might find something different than the other conversation. My thoughts. So are we at time? We are at time, but perhaps we could finish on this one last yes. question. 
So building on what Angela has suggested, um, Suha says, in this case, any, th any thoughts on engaging deans or leadership regarding community engagement? Their approval is also needed in addition to guiding our faculty. Yes, so to that, to Angela's point, uh, first of all, there was a pandemic. <laughs> there was a pandemic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, one of the problems that we ran into is that the time, the timing of all this was that um, it was right about the start of the pandemic that we had a number of things we could go on. And the faculty were shifting into online and we were focused on other things. Uh, the other thing, of course, we've had changes in leadership. Uh, I'd also say in arts and sciences, <laughs> the former dean was not as receptive to our messages uh, at the time he was there. So uh, going forward, I think right now, uh, the new provost absolutely is squarely behind us. And he's keen to do that to deans. Uh, I think building on that, there's now work for us to, you know, we, the, one of the most important things that needs to happen though is our policy change. The tenure and promotion policy, have engagement addressed in there, but it's it's a little it's a little murky. It's hard for a, a to track faculty member to go by what's on our policy. So, back the success task force has now has recommended those policies be changed and be improved. And that's something that we're working on. The provost is uh, behind that as well. So I think that moving forward, which takes time to get all that done, but I think. Parallel to that, uh, more communication with the deans now and down at the department level is now is necessary. Thank you both. That's that's helpful. Well, in light of time, we want to thank University Outreach and Engagement for bringing Dr. Dublin up here and thank our online participants for joining us and those of you who are here in the room. We finish with our appreciation. Pleasure being here. Thank you.